uh, a few points about the Zoom platform. Forward here. Uh, you will not be able to unmute yourself during this presentation, but we still want to hear from you. Uh, your questions are definitely encouraged. Um, so click um, right here. Uh, please use the chat button to open a new box where you can type out your questions. You can also use the chat box if you have a technical issue that you need help with. We'll be monitoring the chat box throughout. We'll have, also have live Q&A after the presentation about an hour from now. In the participants box, you'll find a raise hand function. We will be asking you to weigh in by raising your hand periodically. I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. Well, you do have the option to turn off your camera by clicking stop video. We would like to ask everyone to keep their cameras on during the meeting since this will help keep everyone engaged. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can click the video button in the bottom left-hand corner and, uh, to control your camera. All right. When you click the participants box shown on the previous screen, you'll open the menu you see here on the right hand side on your screen. You should be able to see the raise hand function here. At the bottom of that menu is the chat box where it says type message here. If you'd like to change how your name appears on Zoom, hover over your name and click rename. A Couple more details before we get started. Uh, we will be launching several pools as we go through the content of this webinar. Your answers are confidential. We only see the percentage of people who cho choose each answer. The polls will pop up on your screen, giving you an option to click one or more answers, depending on the question. Ask for help in the chat box if the poll fails to appear on your screen or if you have any other issues. Also, we recommend that you do not use full screen view so that you have easier access to the chat box and the raise your hand icon. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded, but your video will not be. Um, and now it's me, your presenter. Uh, my name is Brian Wolf. Uh, trail name is Iceman. Uh, I know some of you for sure, and it's good to see some familiar faces. Um, Co-owner of Roads, Rivers, and Trails. Uh, so if you've been in the shop, we've probably met. Uh, my first backpacking trip was a through hike of the Appalachian Trail. So that's right, the very first time I went out, I stayed out for 170 days. Um, and then very relevant to kind of what we're talking about, my favorite presentation is on cold weather uh, backpacking prep. So, it, you know, that includes knowing how to stay warm out in cold environments. So any questions about that stuff as we go. Uh, I'd also like to thank Barry and Denise for joining me today, and I will let them uh, introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Barry Randall and um, I'm the uh, chairperson of the outings committee of the Miami Group Sierra Club and also one of the backpack school uh, trainers. Uh, I've been uh, doing backpacking as well as other outdoor activities for uh, more years than I care to count and uh, it's a pleasure being here and thank you all for being here. Denise? Hi, my name is Denise Tingle. Trail name Pippi Longstockings because I wear braids when I backpack. And I've been camping, hiking, backpacking for 45 plus years. I am the hiking chair leader for the Miami Group Sierra Club along with an instructor for the backpacking school. In addition, I lead cycling and rides and backpacking trips. And my passion, of course, is backpacking, cycling, and anything outdoors. Welcome everyone and glad you could be here for this presentation. Awesome, thank you both. They'll be monitoring, um, launching our polls and monitoring questions and um, any help they could be. Um, definitely keep them active on the chat box, please. Um, and that brings us to the topic at hand. So thanks for joining us uh, for sleeping bags, the soft talkers of the bear world, definitely fun. Um, and um, so we'll kind of, we'll be going over um, a lot of things here. So we'll kind of dive right into it. Um, in discussing sleeping bags, it's important to instead look at your entire sleep system. Uh, so your, your bag, your sleeping bag is really just a part of it. Um, we want to look at your sleeping bag, your sleeping pad, and your sleeping bag liner, 
can combine all of those things to find a true comfort range and what you're really going to be comfort with, comfortable with. So we're going to look at the features of each of those things. Um, sometimes one of those things can help supplement the other, and so we're going to look at each of them a little bit more closely. Um, so how warm is your bag really? To understand sleeping bags, we first have to dig into the science of how they work a little bit. A few quick notes. Sleeping bags work best when fully utilized. So that means that the hood is up and it is zipped tight. If you're not using every feature of the bag, you won't get all the benefit from it. Uh, they shouldn't have too much extra room because that is more space for your body to heat up. Um, and of course, their function is to keep this layer of loft around your body. The more loft, the more insulation it's going to provide. Um, but we want to know how we can tell how well they're really going to do. So let's start with this. Let's start with a show of hands. Do you trust your sleeping bag's temperature rating? So if you have a sleeping bag, and you bought it, and it had a temperature range, did you or do you trust it? Not so seeing many hands. Not getting many hands. So. <laughs> and, and I don't know if it's for fighting the hand box or we just don't trust our sleeping bags. And that's that's okay too. We got, got a couple now. Yeah, we've got a few. Okay. Well let's let's talk about why um, that might be confusing or, or or why you haven't you haven't trusted it. So so we're gonna talk about um, we're, we'll dig into the science of it. So um, most sleeping bag companies now use um, a third-party test system called an EN um, test rating. And that helps us to understand and compare the warmth qualities of sleeping bags. So it's important to have or understand that number. Uh, think of it as an even playing field for manufacturers. The system provides up to three numbers to help understand its performance. If there's only one advertised number, it is most often the comfort rating or what would be the middle number, meaning how cool can it be and have the average male sleep comfortably throughout the night? So to sleep as you would at home, very comfortably for about eight hours. So that's that middle a number or sometimes the only number you might, you might get out of it. When there is more than one number, it's typically providing a scale. Um, so ranging from uh, the far, uh, left side of that center number would be more of a survival rating. This would be from the old military world of ratings. And then on the opposite side, on the far right side of that middle number, uh, would be the average comfort rating sometimes for someone that does not sleep very warm uh, and needs a little bit more help. Um, and often, because we heat up, our bodies work and heat up differently, closer to the female rating of a sleep bag. So when we look at those, they could be a hey, little Brian, bit. Brian, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, but don't the ratings also assume that you're wearing a base layer um, at the at when they take the the rating? The uh, the dummies they use, like so, they'll basically put like a heat core dummy in there, and it's not as if they have a base layer on them. Okay. But okay. Um, um, I think it's just in the bag. That, okay. that could be true, though, and, and we could get to pajamas and such as well if you guys have questions about a base layer still recommended, and that's like um, that next to skin heat for right. sure. Okay. Um, all right, so pop some questions in there. So that, that's kind of a lot in itself, so throw them up there, and we'll get to those in a second as we delve into some sleeping pads. Uh, most people think of the comfort uh, and padding of a sleeping pad, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, that's very important. That's something that you wanna look at. Um, I find that you know, a sleeping pad that's two or more inches is most beneficial for me, but everyone's going to be different. Um, so when we look at some of the different options up on this slide, my very first pad was a Thermarest, um, much like the uh, top left of this slide here. Um, just, uh, I didn't need as much. Um, comfort, this is something that's less than an inch thick, provides, provides less uh, comfort, but it worked uh, for many, many years for me. And then as I, my back became a little bit more picky, I wanted something a little bit more. 
Um, it helps disguise underneath you the rocks and lumps of the ground. Um, other concerns are the ease of use, the ease of inflation or deflation of the, of the sleeping pad. Um, so a fully inflatable sleeping pad versus a self-inflating sleeping pad will have different values there. Um, and, but a sleeping pad's main value um, and something you definitely wanna pay attention to um, is its insulating properties uh, or what is known as the R values. So the R values is just an insulating rating. Think of it just like an EN rating. And new just this year is that there is also a uniform R value now, uh, where previously it was more or less up to the manufacturer. Now they're all like EN using a third party test system. So very comparable um, and is going to help you understand or compare sleeping pads. Uh, for a quick reference, think of a zero to one R value as a summer pad. Um, a one to three is more of a three season sleeping pad. Um, and then a four plus becomes more of a cold weather or winter value, um, just very roughly. Um, unlike sleeping bags, if the sleeping pads R value is higher, that's not something that's going to make you overheat. Um, so uh, it's just going to depend on um, how cold you are most likely to go out in. So we can look at some of the benefits when we put all of that together. Closed cell pads are very light. Um, that's just going to be the foam pad. Uh, nothing ever goes wrong with them. They're quiet and durable. Self-inflating um, could also be quiet. Um, less likely to fail, or if it does, you still have a foam barrier between you and the ground. Um, and come in a variation of thicknesses that could be very comfortable, um, but they're going to pack away a little heavier and a little bit larger because it's foam um, and, um, and air. And then the air pad is gonna be the lightest and the most compact, um, can be much warmer as well. They can put a synthetic fill inside the sleeping pad and can provide um, uh, more cushion without the bulk often. All right, and so that's going to lead us to our first poll question. Barry, if you don't mind launching that. All right, what is the average temperature that you would want to camp at? Uh, select all that apply. You can pick more than one here. Like that it seems some people are up for anything. I like that. I like everyone picking the zero to 32. That's my style. No wrong answers though. All right. Everybody okay. looks like about everybody got their answers in and we're, we're all over the place, but people really like that 32 to 50, de uh, 50 degree range right there. Um, Again, that's another favorite time to go out. Um, it's easier to stay warm sometimes than, um, uh, than it is to stay cool, especially overnight. So uh, a nice 40 or 50 degree night could be a lot of fun. All right. All right, let's, let's break here because uh, that, was, that was a lot in ways. And that's, um, let's see what questions we have. We, um, we got anything on the chat box there? Uh, we don't. So, Brian, but, okay. uh, if anyone has any questions, please throw them out there. Well, that's okay, too. We'll keep going as you think of it. Don't shy away from it. We're, we'll have one more break for questions and then questions at the end. Um, and, um, and anything at all. Oh, Problem that you still no questions. All right. Well, we'll roll here. Um, this is one of the the bigger topics typically. Um, so down versus synthetic fill. So we're going to circle back to sleeping bags. Um, which one should we buy? So we'll start with down. Uh, down bag could be goose or duck down. Uh, the, this natural insulation provides the lightest and most compact option 
um, most of the time. Historically, uh, the downfall of down was uh, that it becomes very matte when it's wet and it loses most of its insulation value uh, because it loses its loft, of course. However, many down bags are now washed with a hydrophobic treatment that protects against exactly that. Um, so uh, this is called dry down is, is one of the, the, the ways you'll see it branded. Um, uh, lastly, the quality of down is signified um, by the fill power number. Uh, for example, 650 or 850 fill power. It is important to see this as strictly a quality and not quantity number. Um, so two sleeping bags with 650 filled down will not necessarily be the same one. We'll kind of dig into that a little bit more with, as we compare it to a synthetic. So that's the quality of down. Look again at synthetic bags. This is where you are getting a more carefree bag. We'll talk more about care later um, as well. While synthetics are heavier or larger, they are also less expensive, uh, much less expensive options. High quality synthetic bags uh, are comparable to a 650 fill powered down bag. Um, so even the best synthetic bag, you usually would compare to a 650 fill power down bag. Um, and uh, we didn't lose Barry, did we? Sorry. I don't see him there. Let's see. Uh, you lost me for a minute, but I'm back. Oh, okay. I was going to say, Barry, if you launch pool number two, we're going to okay. um, some sleeping bag features. Or what people want to get out of a sleeping bag there. So what is the most important to you in a sleep system? This is a pick one, if you had to pick one. Because um, often you, you kind of feel like you have to pick one. <laughs> It's hard to get them all. Pick one or, yeah. I know they all matter, but confident warmth. Yep. Some light and fast. Light and fast definitely going with the down bags there. Awesome. Cool. Call again. All right. So we know that the down's the more, the more compressible. Um, and since it's lighter, you'll get more warmth for its weight. Um, and then other things we didn't mention is just the longer lifespan typically of down. Now that is reliant on the quality of down, uh, but it definitely can have a longer lifespan. Um, and then again, to go over the synthetic, uh, a good point is the uh, it could be non um, <clears throat> uh, So that is important to some people. A lot of fabrics on the down sleeping bags are downproof fabrics. Um, and so sometimes you can still have a down bag, uh, but it's good to know ahead of time if that's something that's going to bother you. So awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right. So let's take a look at some extras of our sleep system here. Uh, pillows, liners, and underquilts for a little bit. Uh, pillows to me are a must. Um, and for me, a foam pillow is what's gonna feel the most natural or the best, uh, just like a, more like a pillow from home. It's just gonna pack a little bit uh, larger. Uh, inflatables are gonna be some of the lightest um, and smallest options. Um, but even better yet, if you really want that light and fast, uh, just this is a great opportunity to double up on something you already have and, and um, have a multiple use for it. So taking a jacket and stuffing it into its own sleeve uh, or maybe even just bringing a, a pillowcase or stuff sack uh, and stuffing extra clothes into it and having that be your pillow as well. Uh, just have an, have an option available uh, will make for a better night's sleep. Um, liners we mentioned from the beginning and we kind of dropped. These are really important though in my opinion. Um, they could be critical in a few ways. One, they're going to keep your sleeping bag cleaner. So we'll get to care of sleeping bags, but it's not always super easy to wash a sleeping bag or you don't want to do it every use. 
Uh, so it's going to be much easier to have a sleeping bag liner, basically just a mummy sheet uh, that goes inside of your sleeping bag. Um, that's going to absorb your body oils and sweat throughout the night. Um, and that's going to machine wash just with the rest of your clothes a bit easier. Uh, the second thing a liner can do is aid in the temperature rating. So they will make uh, sleeping bag liners that, that add up to an advertised 32 degrees. Um, take that number, um, the grain of salt. But uh, the point is, is you can get a lot of um, use out of one sleeping bag by adding other sleeping bag liners and helping to adjust the temperatures you're going to encounter. Uh, and then under quilts, definitely worth a mention as I chill in the hammock in the redwoods there. Um, so when hammock camping, uh, the convection, the, any wind coming from underneath you is going to steal your warmth and hammocks don't have any natural insulation to them. Sleeping pads can help with this, but it can still fight through. So for the really cold temperatures, not only do you have um, a top quilt or a sleeping bag, but you'll also hang an under quilt under the hammock so that the compression is does not destroy the insulating value. Um, so very important if you're a hammock camper uh, to have an under quilt plan there. All right. So circling back to some bags, let's talk about some other things that are important. And a few of you checked these boxes it is just a comfortable space, for example, to fit. Um, so while well, weight savings come from the fill material, material. Uh, primarily, you may also see a big difference bag to bag due to how trim the bag gets. Uh, this is something that was really popular to do years ago. The sleeping bag companies would fight to have the lightest weight sleeping bag. Well, all they did, because they didn't have more advanced materials to fight against each other with, is they just kept taking away from the bag space. And so it was trimmer and trimmer and trimmer, uh, and your knees were buckled together. They've gotten away from that, thank goodness, because nobody was comfortable. That does make for a lighter bag, and as previously discussed, you're going to have an easier time warming that space. But it's considered more of a technical bag, uh, or you'll see it more in mountaineering style bags now at this point uh, for their features. Um, so, da -da -da. Um, so just plan on being snug in those. But companies are getting creative with other features, um, and not only have they widened them up and and they taper them a little bit more softly, um, but you're gonna get other comfort features and some things that you can look for include some vents, um, sometimes dual zips down both shoulders so you can have both arms out at the same time while still being fully in the bag. Um, some of them have full zips going all the way down to the feet and around the feet. This allows for a large like duvet option where you can basically make the sleeping bag into a blanket. Um, some have blanket folds around the neck to help insulate better. Some have foot vents, so if you don't like your feet trapped in the sleeping bag, you can kind of poke them out and air them out a little bit. Um, waterproof materials at the head or the feet, uh, just to help with condensation inside the tent um, and having that last. So all kinds of just creative ways they're always trying to reinvent the sleeping bag and little perks that you can get out of it. Um, getting in a bag will help you understand the fit the most. So if you have the opportunity, obviously in the store, actually get a sleeping pad, pad on the ground, get inside the bag and know that you're comfortable with it. If that's one of your major concerns, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, most bags come in six feet or six, six. Um, uh, however, uh, some manufacturers will make a women's specific bag or a short bag uh, starting at five, six. Um, other differences with the women's specific bags are often color, of course, uh, the fact that they're shorter. Uh, sometimes, uh, although not uh, all the time, they'll have a different shape to them. Uh, so they'll shape different in the hips. Um, and then sometimes the EN rating is moved over one notch, knowing that they want to highlight the far right number instead of the center number. So. Um, you could do that yourself uh, with a unisex bag or a mail bag. You could just look at the number on the right, uh, but they'll just kind of move, move that scale for you. Um, and then uh, quilts. Um, so we also want to look at quilts and not the under quilts for the hammocks, but just in general, uh, quilts are going to be a, a nice ultralight option. Um, it essentially removes the bottom portion of the sleeping bag. Um, and that's going to help reduce weight and pack size. 
Um, the thought process behind that is that, uh, of course, it's going to be smaller um, and that you're compressing the insulation below you when you sleep on a sleeping bag and therein not getting really its full value for any insulation that is below you. Um, now, it does still have some benefit as it kind of fills the gaps and covers the sides, uh, but that's where the quilt comes in. Most quilts are warm weather specific, although they do make some cold weather uh, quilts as well. Um, I still suggest getting one that has at least a foot box option to it, and it's nice to also get a quilt that straps um, around your sleeping pad so that it doesn't fall off you in the middle of the night. Awesome. All right, so let's get into some storage and care. Uh, your bag should always be stored uh, dry. So as soon as we get home, we're gonna empty the bags, lay everything out, and uh, my wife will be mad at me for at least a full day as everything dries out and the shower is overrun with the tent fly and so on and so forth. Um, but everything, everything out that includes your sleeping bags, if they get seriously wet, they can take a pretty long time to dry. Uh, so just give them ample, ample time to kind of dry out there. And then store it in a dry space in its storage sack. Uh, so you never um, want to store it in its compression sack uh, or a stuff sack where it feels even slightly compressed. You want it to be able to breathe and stretch out. Um, it's meant to be compressed only on the short term, day to day, or for the trips or flights. Um, if you're using a liner, um, you won't have to wash it as often. Um, and the liner we mentioned is easier to launder. Uh, as far as the bags go, they do make special detergents, so special down washes, for example. Um, and I recommend not using a washer with any agitator. Um, sometimes they'll have you throw tennis balls or, or something um, uh, in there instead, uh, but you don't want to tear the bag as the fabrics can be pretty light. Um, but also remember that even with good care, all bags are going to degrade over time. Um, so if you have a 15 degree bag, that you've been using for 20 years or you, maybe you haven't used in 20 years, uh, just naturally you might want to assume that that's closer to a 30 or 40 degree bag uh, at this point. The insulation is just going to lose its luster slowly over time um, and so you might want to take it on a test run before dedicating it to a bigger trip. Um, and kind of uh, previously mentioned but the higher quality down uh, again, so that's that down power, uh, the fill power, so uh, 850 as opposed to 650 will have a longer lifespan to it. Uh, it kind of will hold its structure for a longer period of time is one of those benefits. Uh, all right, so let's take another break. Barry, how's our, how's our chat box looking? So Brian, we did get a couple of questions. All right, good. Uh, uh, Quinn was asking about pads and the fact that uh, a lot of the air pads are somewhat noisy. They make that uh, potato chip bag crinkling sound. Yep. Uh, she wanted to know if uh, there were any tips to address that. Um, I, I know it seems to me, and maybe it's my imagination, it seems the newer air pads don't have quite that same problem. And it also seems to me that the older mine gets, the quieter it gets. Although maybe I'm just getting used to it. Yeah, maybe. That's a good question. Thank you, Barry. And, and, and um, I think you're right in a few ways. That I don't know if it goes away. You might be getting used to it. It'd be nice if it did. Um, but yeah, there was a few years there, and this um, goes back to manufacturers wanting to make the lightest pads and lighter and lighter on the materials. And uh, they could still be pretty durable, but they got, they got noisy and they got that reputation. And I unfortunately don't know of a way to go back and fix that. Um, even covering it up or, or whatnot, is, it's still going to kind of have that, that volume. They are getting away from that a bit, not that they don't exist, um, but they're just not as popular. People kind of figured them out. <laughs> um, yep. And the most inflatable pads now, a lot of them, well, um, or the more popular ones, well, maybe a few ounces heavier, um, wake, you, wake you up in the middle of the night. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, we had another question. Uh, Allison was asking uh, what you'd recommend uh, for a spring, summer, fall three season 
bag. I, I know in the warmer months, mm -hmm. I tend to use my quilt just because if it gets too warm, it's a lot easier to just throw it off or whatever. Yep. Uh, and if it gets a little colder, I can add a liner or just a heavier base layer or something like that. But what are your thoughts on those three seasons? Absolutely. So again, so we, I, I take it as building a, a system as well. So three seasons where most people want to be and, and where they're looking at. Um, so uh, having an R value of at least two plus, um, you know, just to kind of have something going on there. It'd be nice if you were close to the three, uh, but you can have a sleeping bag, um, you know, in the, with 30 something degree rating, you know, in the 30 plus degree rating and always kind of add uh, those, those sleeping bag liners to kind of make it work. You know, if you're looking to buy one sleeping bag, especially um, once you get too warm of a bag, it's hard to take it into the summer. Um, and uh, once you, if you get the opposite, uh, too light of a bag, you know, say a 50 degree bag, it's going to be hard to really take that into certain uh, fall environments. Uh, so getting something there in the middle uh, and then supplementing so you can go colder with, with a liner um, is usually going to be the way to go. Um, say a 32 degree bag. Denise or Barry, if, uh, if you have a, other experiences with your setup that if you had one setup to kind of last three seasons, that's Brian. This is Denise. That's what I have with mine. Mine is a, a, a rated 20 degrees. So in the you know spring and fall, I use a liner, and uh, which is the red and black one that gives you like 10 degrees warmer. And then in the summer, typically I just bring my liner, which most of the time is enough anyway. In the you know in the warmer months, so. Uh, but that's how I get by with, right now with one sleeping bag. And I've been using that method for, shoot, good five, six years now. Denise, that's an awesome point. And thank you. The liner can also be a standalone uh, summer sheet. Um, and what's nice other than just a, a sheet is, again, that it's a, a full body like a sleeping bag, uh, a full body cocoon, right, that can cinch around your shoulders. So it's easier to stay into it and just kind of give you just that, take that summer night chill off of you. That's uh, super helpful. Barry, anything to add there? Good. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then also. Um, I see sure someone that... uh, Barry had a question about price comparison: sleeping bag versus a quilt. Uh, well, we're sure. going to jump into quilts I th or prices. I think right now, actually. We can jump right into that um, if there weren't any other questions to address. Wait, uh, Becky had a question about using a quilt. Are you lying directly on the sleeping pad? And um, personally, I almost always wear a base layer um, when I sleep. So, yeah, lying directly on uh, particularly an air pad, I find very uncomfortable because, you know, it's basically a plasticky kind of feel. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're wearing a base layer and then have the quilt, I find it very comfortable. I'd, I'd agree to that. A base layer so that your skin's not on the, the right. it could stick to the pad kind of feel. Um, or again, a, a liner is going to help with that and, and yep. that separation and comfort. Um, yep. as well. Maybe both. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Good questions. Keep them coming. Um, so this is, uh, this, I think this addresses the next question that somebody had here. So uh, this is just a few brands uh, that are thrown up there uh, that we know are trust, but there's many reputable bag and pad manufacturers. Um, when we're looking at a new sleeping bag, um, we are typically for a synthetic, you could be 100 to $200, just roughly. Um, when you're looking at a down sleeping bag, um, you are going to be closer to the 250 to 500 range. Um, and honestly, that could even go up from there depending on what temperature rating you're looking at. Uh, but just in general, that's the price jump, you know, um, that you're looking at for uh, synthetic versus down. Uh, sleeping pads are uh, going to have a, a large range uh, for what they are, anywhere from 25 bucks for some of those closed cell foam uh, to 200 uh, 
dollars for the lightweight insulated inflatable pads. Um, so just kind of two different extremes there. Um, and then for quilts, um, these can be almost ex as expensive as the down sleeping bags because you're really only taking away a portion of the product. Uh, so instead of 250 to 500, um, the down versions will still be 200 to 400 uh, about. So um, there's not much of a drop there, uh, but you can definitely get, um, save a little bit money since you're getting a little bit less product out of it sometimes. Um, but all these companies, um, reliable warranty products um, uh, and a lot of those feature sets that we talked about or extra features that we talked about, um, you know, they're going to be on top of that or they're going to be the innovators in that kind of stuff. And we can dig more into that. If you guys have questions more specifically about brands or, or pricing or anything like that, definitely save those and, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, as we always get questions about those. Um, and I did want to touch on following up on the brand, the whole too good to be true. Just because I see this, um, I feel like a little little too often. Uh, I won't name the company unless anyone wants to ask, but it's it's different every year. Company X um, it just seems every year or two. There's uh, every year there's two or three companies that will pop up um, with products that are um, thirty to fifty percent off retail, um, but online only. Um, and they'll claim to have the same quality products and comparable down or features or um, sometimes even claim to have rated bags. Um, these companies aren't typically around in another year or two. Um, it's kind of a pop up, make money and go. Um, so not companies that will stand behind their products. Um, and while they seem compar comparable, they pretty much never are. So um, for example, I've got a friend that will text me like, what do you think about this or, or call the shop or what do you think about this? And we'll, we'll kind of give you the honest answer. You can always usually find it in the numbers. Um, so um, be careful of which um, temperature rating value that they're giving you. Um, and then we could always dig into exactly the materials that they're using or down that they're using, for example. Um, so sometimes the, their zero degree bag has half of the downfill of some of our um, reputable brand names um, for their zero degree bag. Uh, so of course they cannot both be zero degree bags um, and have um, half of the down fill to them. Um, so just careful uh, with some of that. Um, so that's um, you should stop for questions again here. Or we could kind of well, let's let's go through this first, and then we'll do another set of questions uh, at the end. Um, that concludes uh, the presentation uh, that we had prepared. But hang around. Um, uh, first, how did we do? Uh, we hope that you found a few new ideas um, or a greater understanding of of the material here, to so that you can greater enjoy backpacking trips in the future. Uh, we have one more pool for you. Um, Barry, if you could launch the last poll. Um, or you know I'm what? seeing the poll here, Brian. You know what? We might have missed the last poll. Well, you know what? Yeah, we'll, do, uh, <laughs> we'll do questions yeah. as the poll. We'll do the poll in the chat box. Give us some yep. feedback just on how we did. Um, you know, did you learn something new? Did you feel like you mostly knew everything um, uh, that we covered today? Um, kind of give us a little rating there so we know how to adapt this, so especially over Zoom. This is uh, all new for the group. Um, and so we want to continue these presentations and make sure everybody gets uh, the value that they want out of it. So uh, I'll mention again that we'll post a PDF copy of this presentation on the Sierra Club website, along with a backpacking gear list. Uh, we are placing a link in the chat box uh, to the page on the Sierra Club website, and we will. Um, you'll also find a schedule of future webinars posted there. Um, and within three days, we'll also post a link there to a recording of this webinar, um, along with responses to any questions that we didn't answer for you today. Um, and as we said, you'll find a whole host of other things on the Sierra Club website, uh, like schedule of our innings meetings, 
uh, which are a series of educational meetings, our newsletter. We do have a question, a couple of more questions, uh, Brian, when you're ready. Awesome. Yep, um, actually, and we're, I think we're pretty much there. Yeah, if you're interested in knowing more about the outings committee, you can always check out a recorded presentation from last year that describes our function and activities. Um, so that's um, have the live Q and A. Let's do it. Thank you. We have a couple more questions, Brian. If right. you're uh, if you're ready. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Barry. What do we got? He might have cut out, Brian. So Renee has three down bags, but she doesn't know what they are rated to. Is there any way to determine that a finding that the bag fails you at a low temperature? Is there any way to find out what her ratings are? Um, so usually, and, and you're welcome to email us at, um, Renee, I know you, I'm glad you joined the call, hi. Um, uh, if, uh, if you wanna email, um, Whatever details you could find, I could try to find out for you the original ratings of the bags. So any markings or brand names and uh, names of the bag, uh, I could usually track it down and see what the original rating was. And so I'm happy to kind of do some digging for you. Uh, just email, uh, you know, Roads, Rivers, and Trails. Um, it's hard to say what the current rating is, though, if you're dealing with older bags. Again, I would just kind of depending on their age um, or if they're yours, depending on their use, um, you know, kind of just slowly deduct a few degrees every few years um, from what you're gonna uh, get out of that. And then of course, um, if you're really nervous about it, you know, I get some details back to you and you're not sure, I always recommend just jumping out uh, on the back porch or whatever you can do one night, you know, test it a little bit somewhere where you can just come back inside, um, see, if see if it does the job before going out and being stuck outside uh, without another option. Okay, another one we have from AJ is for liners, which do you prefer, fleece or synthetic? And both Barry and I kind of gave our perspective on that, Brian, but if you could also uh, put what your opinion awesome. is. AJ, thanks for joining as well. Awesome. Um, uh, fleece is usually going to be a, a in my opinion, it usually ends up being a bulkier, warmer option. So uh, for winter use, uh, most fleece that I know, uh, most of the liners I have will be like a synthetic and, and end, up, uh, end up being a little lighter or smaller. And if you want to get even lighter and you're just looking for something to get your keep your bag clean, uh, silk is going to be typically even lighter and smaller than the synthetic ones. Okay, and then another one was, um, let's see, oh yeah. Uh, Quinn asked, for air pads, should I be concerned with mold inside due to moisture from mouth blowing? Absolutely. Um, and that's something that is being addressed more in sleeping pads now in the past few years, um, that they're really trying to come up with creative ways to incentivize you to not use your breath. Um, and that's something that they didn't do a good job about, uh, both in uh, marketing or instructions or giving you the tools to do it. Um, so whether it's a small battery powered pump or maybe it's a stuff sack that attaches to the valve where you just kind of roll the air um, into the sleeping pad, all of those things are going to help it last longer. Now they did start putting uh, like antimicrobial coatings and things on the inside of the pad so that that's not something that should just happen right away. You should still get a good lifespan out of, you know, even older pads. They, they, they've been doing that a while. Uh, but that kind of stuff just doesn't last forever. So eventually it can be an issue. Good question. So I have a question on that one then, Brian. Is that something mm -hmm. if you should be concerned about? Meaning that, uh, like for mine, I have the Neo Air, right? And I've mm -hmm. never used anything but my mouth to blow it up. So I've had it for shoot probably at least is there any like is there a way to clean it or do you know anything like that um not that i know of um as far as as far as cleaning it i'm not sure what you do there um but it's it's just gonna um 
I mean, I don't know if it will be a smell thing. I, I guess it eventually could. It would be pretty bad at that point, but I think it's just a deterioration thing to the inside of the pad. And so you'll kind oh, of know okay. when it's gone that too far. Make, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, so um, just its ability to hold air even as it kind of eats at the, um, uh, Inside it, uh, it might not make much difference, Brian, but I'm assuming, you know, like storing a sleeping bag, you probably want to store the an air pad loose, you know, not rolled up, not closed up. You know, yeah, obviously it's still trapped air inside of it, but at least it's not all rolled up. Yeah, uh, great, yeah great point, Barry. Totally true. Um, yeah, if you have the space to, um, I think this is uh, especially true, uh, I have found with self-inflating sleeping pads because that foam, if it's compressed for too long, uh, really struggles to kind of take its shape. It, it, at the very least, it takes a long time to take its shape again. So I'll have, um, I have my self-inflating pad just with the valve open underneath a bed, for example. Uh, so that both just kind of helps with the um, airflow and just that the foam is always uh, allowed to rise. And with any of this gear, um, same, same with the sleeping bags and not being rolled and compressed, it's not just the insulation, it's the fabric. So when we look at sleeping pads or sleeping bags, just all of those folds and, and whatnot and those lightweight fabrics uh, long term could just kind of wear on the fabrics a little bit more. So it's also nice having those just unrolled. Uh, Brian, I have a question too. Uh, as far as cleaning your sleeping bag, do you just follow the manufacturer's uh, recommendation? Yeah, it's always good to check, uh, just check back on the manufacturer's um, website. Um, at the very least, if you follow it to a T and something goes wrong, you know who to be mad at and, and get a warranty. <laughs> it's never a bad idea. Um, although the care is mostly the same with it. Um, you know, bag, bag to bag. Um, another thing I didn't mention with the care of the sleeping bags um, is I, I'll usually, uh, some bags come with a wash sack. So if you ever see it with a big cotton sack that it comes with, for example, uh, that's also great for washing the bag because it's just one more thing that's going to help protect um, the lighter weight fabric of the sleeping bag from, from getting uh, torn or, or beaten up in, inside the washer. Awesome. Okay, Nancy had a question. Do some of you prefer a local store or use online company? I can give my opinion and then Barry and Brian. Uh, <laughs> I'll have my opinion. Personal know-how at the independent stores because I feel like, you know, you can return it, you can talk to them about it, you know, and you know they're going to be there. Um, and they have expertise that you're you know, you're not talking to a computer or you're put on hold, whatever, and they have a lot of knowledge because they're actually using the equipment. So that would be my take. Uh, Barry or Brian? No, I definitely agree. I mean, it, it's to me, it's, it's the expertise of, you know, having people you can talk to who have firsthand experience. Um, that's, that's hard to be, unless you're buying a pure commodity, you know, you, you know exactly what you want and you've had it before. Um, but uh, if there's any kind of knowledge you're trying to gain, that absolutely, uh, you know, local store. Well, thank you guys. Obviously, I'm going to be biased. But even if you're not in the Cincinnati or Milford <laughs> area, I'm happy to point you to some. Uh, we know a lot of great independent shops across the country, including in Ohio, up in Dayton, great Miami Outfitters, up in Cleveland, Appalachian Outfitters. And all these guys are very community focused, which I love. They're very customer service focused, which obviously we love. And so um, I'm you know, happy to suggest even outside of our area, uh, some great shops to hit up if anybody uh, needs needs a list. Super. Which is a pretty good segue into the slide that we're on, really. <laughs> um, the uh, this presentation is happily sponsored by uh, Roads, Rivers, and Trails, independently owned outdoor outfitter. Uh, I should say 118 Main Street. I'll have to make a note to get that corrected. Uh, so check us out if you're ever um, in the Milford area, East Cincinnati, or online at roadsriversandtrails.com. Uh, the Miami Group Sierra Club, miamigroup.org there. Uh, and Summit Truck, Trek and Travel for Adventure Travel. Um, we added to the mailing list, email Nancy, Summit 
travel at yahoo.com. Um, so thank you to um, all the sponsors that really help kind of put these Zoom calls together um, and um, help us kind of keep things, keep things rolling.